There was a time when the future of mobile phones could truly have been open. Yes, you heard that right. There was a time when smartphones could be completely open source, free, and even distributed with RPM and .deb packages. A time when Nokia, the European giant of mobile phones, dominated the global market with a 50% market share and was building something revolutionary, Migo. In the Finnish labs of this global telecom powerhouse, they were working on a response to iOS and Android with an open system that used Linux, a set of open source libraries, and non-proprietary packaging. This could have changed our perspective forever and the way we interact with smartphones today. Migo was a collaboration between Nokia and Intel, and the project was overseen by the Linux Foundation. The potential of this story was enormous and groundbreaking. It was the real alternative. The future we lost. But the story of Migo is a complex one, full of dreams, visions, internal conflicts, and fatal decisions. Now sit down, grab your popcorn, go full screen with Firefox, and let's begin this story in 2005 when a small group within Nokia called Oso, Open Source Software Operations, led by Ari Jaxi, who resigned in October 2010 to move to HP and work on WebOS, began developing MAMO, a Linux-based operating system for mobile devices. MAMO was essentially a Debian adaptation for mobile systems. It used apt, DPKG, and featured real multitasking. The team chose GTK libraries to build the first graphical interface for MAMO, called Hilden. Originally, with the first device released, Hilden 1.1 was designed to work with a stylus on 800x480 screens, like that of the Nokia 770. It included a task navigator, status bar, application launcher, and content area. It was modular and optimized for small screens. It supported true multitasking with multiple desktop-style windows. The first implementation of Hilden on MAMO was in the Nokia 770 Internet Tablet released in 2005 with MAMO 1.1 based on Debian and GPE, later evolved with Genome components. It used the full GNOME infrastructure, GStreamer, DBus, GConf Editor. With the birth of these early prototypes, the 770 and later the N800, the small MAMO development team, despite having limited resources, demonstrated remarkable agility. Ideas flowed freely, but the hardware components were often low quality, and much of the work was outsourced which created further technical challenges down the line. Meanwhile, a growing unease spread through Nokia's halls. The flagship OS, Symbian, had dominated the mobile phone market for years, but that dominance was built on fragile foundations. Symbian was a system designed for limited devices with physical keyboards, small displays, and essential features. It wasn't built for the fast approaching future an era of increasingly smart, connected, flexible devices capable of replacing a computer in users' hands. Those working at Nokia knew it. A revolution was on the horizon. It wasn't just about adding features to phones anymore, but rethinking entirely what a phone could be. A new system was needed. A new approach. In 2007, Nokia was experimenting with a small group developing prototypes in collaboration with subcontractors, often Chinese and Indian but communication and management issues caused significant delays. Team dynamics were anything but harmonious, and the project was slowly growing alongside the bureaucracy. At the same time, another company was betting everything on a revolutionary idea not far from Mamo's path, the iPhone. But Apple had a clear, cohesive, and powerful vision, not just for the device, but for its marketing, its ecosystem, and the business model around it. They managed every detail, from hardware and suppliers to strategic partnerships. What they presented to the world was nothing short of shocking. The iPhone, I won't tell you anything you don't already know, and sadly, you probably have it in your pocket. But it wasn't just a device, it was a declaration of war, a manifesto for what personal technology was becoming. And Nokia? Nokia held 50% of the global phone market in 2007. It had resources, engineers, and everything needed to respond but that very success made everything more complicated. The iPhone wasn't revolutionary in itself. Nokia engineers already had internal prototypes that could have rivaled it. The real issue was the shift taking place between hardware manufacturers and service providers. Nokia was firmly rooted in the old model, with Symbian as its crown jewel. It sold incredibly well. That success made them hesitant to bet everything on MAMO. To launch a project like iOS or Android, 
centralized platforms combining software, hardware, services, brand identity, third-party developers, app stores, telecom operators, and hardware partners, you couldn't afford to have two competing business models. You had to make a choice, and Nokia didn't. They chose to protect their market share by prioritizing Symbian while continuing to develop MIMO. In 2007, Oso officially became the MIMO team. Ambitions grew. The Nokia N810 arrived. It could have been the first MIMO phone, but the phone functionality was removed for political reasons. The Symbian team feared internal competition, a cold war between two platforms under the same roof. The first crack in the towering skyscraper of Nokia's 20-year success. That same year, Google unveiled Android. Once again, it wasn't a phone manufacturer launching a new smartphone system. That's no coincidence. Android was Linux-based and marketed as open source, but over the years, Google would prove it wasn't truly open. It was open source shackled to Google services and its hardware relationships. Between 2007 and 2009, Nokia kept developing MAMO. Eventually, the N900 was released, the first real Linux smartphone. MAMO 5, for Mantle, was responsive with a GTK Plus UI. Meanwhile, work began on MAMO 6, codename Harmaton, now using the Qt interface, a graphical framework owned by Nokia since 2008 after acquiring Norwegian company Trolltech. While iOS and Android climbed from 0% to 14% and 4% global smartphone share respectively, Nokia was still betting on Symbian and trying to rewrite its UI using Qt. But time wasn't on their side. Nokia couldn't predict how quickly smartphones would take over. Internal conflicts, blindness, and lack of vision slowed down a company that literally didn't know what to do. They looked for a partner, but being a mobile phone giant, other players were reluctant to ally with them. The choice fell on Intel, already active in open source mobile, with Moblin, developed with the Linux Foundation and based on Fedora and RPM. In 2010, at the Mobile World Congress, Nokia and Intel announced Migo, a fusion of MAMO and Moblin. MIGO was born under the Linux Foundation's wing with the goal of creating a unified operating system for smartphones, netbooks, tablets, TVs, and cars. But Harmaton was already too far along. Nokia decided to continue developing MIMO 6, making it compatible with MIGO 1.2. Another half-baked decision that crippled the entire project. Harmaton used .deb, MIGO used RPM. Qt became the heart of everything. A small curiosity, while MAMO allowed easy root access, with MIGO Harmaton things changed. Nokia introduced Aegis, an advanced security system that managed application privileges, making the system more secure, but also controversial among power users who wanted full control over their devices. In the chaos, two different UI tools in Q2 were created, Orbit, Symbian, and LibDui, MAMO. Months of work overlapped, were discarded, and rewritten. Even here, decisions weren't made clearly or cohesively. The Harmattan interface went through three evolutions. The original, inspired by Vygotsky's activity theory, was abandoned. Then came the simple Dolly UI, too minimal. Finally, in 2010, came the Swipe UI, elegant, fluid, modern. A masterpiece designed with the help of New York Studio 8020 with ex-Apple and Adobe designers. Harmattan's interface, its styling, UI, and user interaction was ahead of its time. It took Apple and Android several more years to embrace fully swipe-based interfaces without physical buttons. Meanwhile, various prototypes emerged. Columbus, first Harmattan device, never released. Dolly, with QWERTY keyboard, became the N950 for developers. Lanku became the legendary Nokia N9, Lauda that was never released, Soiro with Intel x86 chip. Senna, a Harmattan tablet, killed before launch. On June 21, 2011, Nokia unveiled the N9, a design and engineering gem, unibody polycarbonate, curved AMOLED screen, swipe UI, a product years ahead of its time, indisputably brilliant, and tragically, born already dead. Around the same time, CEO Stephen Elop was trying to steer the company away from collapse. In 2011, Nokia's market share had plummeted. Android held 49%, iOS 19, and Symbian only, 17%. In just two years, Nokia had fallen from 4-7%. 17% with no viable alternative to the two dominant proprietary systems. Almost simultaneously with the N9's launch, behind the scenes, Nokia was already negotiating with Microsoft. Developers and insiders were well aware of this shift. Naturally, no one believed in the future of Migo, 
except the community and users, who were genuinely enthusiastic about the product. The company ultimately turned to Microsoft under ELOP's leadership to produce Windows Mobile smartphones. Within a few years, Nokia vanished, first absorbed into Microsoft's phone division, then dismantled entirely. With the failure of Nokia's open source experiment, Mego, the dream of a Linux-based mainstream mobile operating system died with it. iOS is closed, but fluid and integrated. Android is open, but already under Google's control. Mego was something else, something rare truly free, truly open, and built on solid foundations. Today, we all feel the frustration of not having a credible, open source alternative for our smartphones. We were so close to that dream, and that's what makes it so bitter. One thing is certain, often, in fact almost always, the worst ideas perish. But sometimes even brilliance, if not carried forward properly, exists only as a monument to what could have been and never was. And that's what we've talked about.